Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Ways and Means Committee. Um, please join us as Senator D'Alessandro leads us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It being uh, 9 o'clock, or perhaps slightly after, uh, we'll convene the hearing on Senate Bill 437 Local and welcome prime sponsor, Senator Perkins Quoka, uh, to speak to her bill relative to the additional municipal fee for transportation improvements. Good morning, Senator. Good morning, Senator, and thank you for having me today. For the record, I am Senator Rebecca Perkins Quoka from District 21, representing the city of Portsmouth and the surrounding towns. I'm prime sponsor of SB 437. <laughs> uh, an act relative to the additional municipal fee for transportation improvements. SB 437 is a refile of HB. 409 from 2019, which received broad bipartisan support. It faced a veto, um, and we were unable to override that, but it did enable, and this bill does the same thing, enable um, an optional fee for municipal permits from $5 to $15, which can be used for small infrastructure projects like sidewalks and bike lanes. By increasing the maximum maximum optional fee by just $10, we can open up a wealth of opportunities to make our communities more livable for all of us. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to present on SB 437. I'll be happy to try to answer any questions that you have. All right, thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from members of the committee? Senator Daniels. Thank you. Uh, when these fees are raised, are they raised uh, by a vote of the governing body or the legislative body? It's, uh, well, either one. I mean, in Portsmouth, for example, we had a fee committee, so the fee committee would sort of assess whether we wanted to institute these five, $5 fees on top of our car vehicle registrations, and then that was a recommendation to the city council, which implemented it. Follow up. Follow up. So, in in a uh, in a town that did not have a council, yet a board of selectmen, would the selectmen make, be making the decision, or would that have to go before a vote of the people? Um, I believe the selectmen would be enabled to do that, but I don't know the answer for sure. So I can look into that and get back to you. Okay. Like thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any further questions? Senator Hennessy, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Good morning. I'm just wondering, is the Municipal Association testifying on this? If they're not, I will ask Senator Perkins Quoka a question. I have received a letter from the Municipal Association expressing their support for 437. Are, are they so from the Municipal Association here? Okay. I do have a, a question for Senator Perkins Quoka. Uh, would you be uh, amenable to changing this? to ensure that the legislative body, meaning the people, get to vote on any such increase in, uh, in, in towns uh, as opposed to cities and perhaps getting vote in the cities themselves as well. Would that be something that you'd be amenable to? Yeah, I'd be open to that. I mean, as I said to Senator Daniels, let me confirm what, you know, the existing procedure would be under law. Um, but I know, you know, the intent is to relieve the burden on property taxes by making this more of a user fee. You know, it's it's money raised from transportation dollars to be used for other kinds of infrastructure and transportation. So um, I, I would think that making sure it was something that could be passed at town meeting would be, uh, would be proper. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Senator. Um... So, um, could you, if you're going to think about that, think about how in the cities there's not an annual election, there's an election every two years. 
so would there be a way to make sure that if the towns would be voting every year, um, either would continue to have their governing board or um, would it have to be only put to the voters on the city ballot every two years? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. I think that um, if it's an act of the legislative body that the council could do it at any time in a city, but, um, but let me make sure of all those nuances procedurally. I understand the question. Yeah. Yep. Further questions? Hearing none, thank you very much. Okay, and we'll look, thank you, Senator. Will you provide the body with feedback on, on, on the legislative versus governing and all that stuff? I certainly will. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next in line is uh, Catherine Heck from the Municipal Association speaking uh, in favor. Welcome. Good morning, Chairman Guida and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Catherine Heck from the New Hampshire Municipal Association. And Could you pull the, yeah, yeah, a little bit closer? I know. Our chronic problem. There you go. I apologize, sir. We are here to support um, SB 437 because this is a local option for local projects and to answer your questions, it is approved by the legislative body. So the legislative body would approve this local fee. So that would happen at the annual town meeting. It's included in the RSA, which is prescribed on how that process would work. I have submitted written testimony to you to encourage the committee to vote ought to pass on on this bill because it does allow for non-property tax revenue specifically for transportation improvements to be determined by the legislative body in that community. As of 2020, 35 of the 234 municipalities have chosen to enact this local option and their communities support this fee. And by amending the cap from $5 to $15, it does adjust for inflation and restore the purchasing power that the fee initially provided five years ago in 1997. The other point I would like to address is, of course, we are all aware that our municipal budgets are strained and the maintenance and improvement costs of infrastructure have gone up significantly. This RSA in 260. 1153 does allow these fees to be used as matching dollars for state and federal grants. And with the passage of the Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, that is going to bring in over a billion dollars in the next five years to New Hampshire, with many of those dollars being competitive grants for our municipalities. Allowing this fee to be increased would allow those who have already adopted the fee to potentially choose if they'd like to increase this fee. And allow them to expand that opportunity to have those matching dollars for these projects, or perhaps it would be more enticing for a municipality to consider this fee if they can use these funds for matching projects. I do have a copy of my written testimony, and I attached, I also have a copy of the 35 municipalities that have adopted the fee if you are interested in that information. I can take any questions that you might have. Senator Hennessy. A um, couple things. One, just to clarify, this is a property fee. We're saying not, it's not a property tax, but vehicles are considered property for people. Um, I just want to um, clarify, 15% seems very low for towns or cities to have adopted this. Why have other towns not adopted this or have um, their um, citizens um, said no to this fee? So I can't speak to why some towns have not adopted it. Um, perhaps it never even was approached as an option for some communities if it never came forward. However, the 35 towns that have adopted it, mostly our larger communities, um, are already um, excited about the opportunity and we've heard feedback that they would like to raise it. One community would only like to go to the $10 amount, not to the $15 amount. They think that would be extremely beneficial for their infrastructure projects, so that would be one example. Um, I can also say that I'm sure many communities, um, knowing that there's these federal dollars now over the next five years, they might consider this, this tax. And because it's up to the legislative body, it is a local option so that if this is not right for a community, then they can certainly um, not move forward with this type of additional fee. However, it is not seen on the property tax bill itself. It's at the time of registering their vehicle. 
further questions? Senator Daniels. Thank you. Can, can you refer to the statute about the uh, that allows the uh, or that designates the legislative body? Sure. That is under Section Two Sixty One One Fifty Three. One Fifty Three. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Do you know if the statute allows the repeal or the changes? to be made by the legislative body through the normal warrant article process? Um, I'm reading the statute right now, sir, and I do have a copy of it. My understanding is anything that is enacted by the legislative uh, body can be certainly retracted by the legislative body. And that is how the law typically works, um, but I can certainly find out a definitive right, answer for you. Uh, would the sponsor be amenable to an amendment that states that Clearly, that it can be amended or repealed up to the limit or below it by the legislative body through a warrant process. Thank you. Further questions from the committee? Hearing none, thank you very much. Um, I will leave a copy of my, these, the towns, please. if you'd like it, sir. Yep. And so, from the remote testifying, uh, Senator Ruth Ward from District 8 supports. Todd Selig, town manager from Durham, supports. Michael Branley, member of the public from Swansea, supports. William Deshatko, elected official representing himself, supports. Ed Morris, member of the public from Enfield, supports. Paul Dargy, an elected official representing himself, supports. Richard Crocker, a member of the public representing himself, supports. Rick Sawyer, a member of the public from the town of Bedford, supports. Uh, Diglin McEachern, an elected official and mayor uh, from the city of Portsmouth, supports. And Caitlin Little, a member of the public representing herself, supports. And that is all the testimony we have on Senate Bill 437. Does anyone uh, in the public here wishes to speak that either hasn't or has already spoken? Hearing none, we'll close the hearing on Senate Bill 437. All right, being 9.15,
we will open the hearing on Senate Bill 441, FN Local, and dealing with providing municipalities to receive a portion of fines collected for motor vehicle offenses and recognize the prime sponsor, Senator Perkins Corbin. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you, Senator. Good morning. For the record, I'm Senator Rebecca Perkins Quoka, representing District 21, um, the city of Portsmouth and the surrounding towns. I'm prime sponsor of SB 441 FNL, an act relative to the municipal share of fines for motor vehicle speeding offenses. As many may be surprised to find out, uh, those speeding tickets are enforced and collected locally by municipal police. They receive 0% of the revenue from said tickets. Uh, I was surprised to find this out. And SB 441 FNL will allow municipalities to keep 20% of the revenue from such municipal speeding tickets. Currently, the state keeps 100% of the revenue from these speeding tickets, despite the fact that the municipality paying the police officers to enforce the speed and safety regulations and enforcing the ticket uh, pay all the costs. SB 441 FN will create a more balanced and fair distribution of that revenue for municipal speeding tickets. The city of Portsmouth and the town of and, and Newmarket strongly support this bill, but Durham remains neutral. So I just wanted to make that clear for the record for my district. Um, there's a couple of issues that have been raised in connection to the policy around this, so I just want to proactively address those. One is um, that, you know, having municipal officers have their sort of budget and revenue connected to, to issuing tickets and to stopping residents um, might create, in some people's mind, an incentive for those officers, for example, to stop their residents and, and give them tickets. Um, and I'd just like to point out in connection with that that that's how our state system works at this time. You know, state troopers pull over our residents to issue tickets, and that money is collected 100% by the state. So if that's sort of a structural concern, then we have that today um, at the state level. In addition, you know, it's, it's only 20% of the revenue that we're talking about, and so, um, you know, it's, it's a small amount, and in my mind, it's, a contribution to the cost, which is substantial, as we know, on our communities, um, to maintaining, you know, a first-rate police force and making sure that they're able to be present on the roads to keep everyone safe. Uh, secondly, I'd like to point out that, you know, municipalities are struggling for sources of revenue, and so just like my previous bill, uh, which, you know, would create an additional way for municipalities to raise local revenue in addition to property taxes, this is um, a way that we can relieve the property taxes on our residents across the state by providing municipalities with an additional tool um, in their tool belt. So um, we all know how property taxes are a concern. They're a concern to the cost of housing and, and keeping our next generation here. And so it's something that I know I'd like to address as well as making sure that the towns and cities in my district have all the tools that they can um, to raise revenue the way that they need to and would like to. Um, you know, I think ultimately what this comes down to is a question of, um, of fairness, you know, similar to the room and meals tax, cities and towns are footing the bill for um, making sure that they're providing a safe um, environment for their residents. and. That's expensive, and I think that we at the state, our job is to enable them to be able to do that in the best way possible. So uh, I'll leave it at that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity to present today, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any questions from members of the committee? Senator Hennessy, please. Thank you. Nice to see you again. <laughs> you too. Uh, I have a few questions. So sure. If, if you drive on 93, there's a few towns that always seem to have a local law enforcement officer. Um, pulling speeders over. Um, so you're telling me that those local communities do not see any of that funding currently for those tickets? Yeah, it's my understanding that if it's a municipal officer that pulls you over and issues you the ticket, that all of that revenue, whether it's a state trooper or a local officer, goes to the state. Okay. And how would this affect um, if you were to pull over an ATV on a trail? or on a road, or um, how would it affect non, 
I'm not quite sure where this RSA goes and how detailed it goes back to sure. address all types of vehicles that could be pulled over in those tickets. Sure. Um, I'm happy to look into that. I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head, but again, it's my understanding and, and no exceptions to this have been brought to my attention that all speeding tickets, all of their revenue goes to the state. So, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Senator Daniels. Thank you. If the money were to be sent back to localities, uh, where would that money go? Sure. Um, it's a good question right now. The way the statute is written, it can go into the municipality's general fund. Um, but certainly, you know, the drafting could address that. Um, did you have something specific in mind, Senator? Uh, I just, I guess just a question as to whether the local police department would be able to use that in their, their annual cost because you did make a statement too. Uh, that uh, this could provide some property tax relief, mm -hmm. which also would raise a concern. Um, I think, you know, people be always right about politics as local. And um, I think when, when you start allowing the, the uh, local police to start collecting money or, or receiving it from the state because they make a stop, it does lend the perception that what they're trying to do is to get more money coming in, and it may be because they want to try to lower property taxes or something. So I, I'm just wondering about all that quagmire. Yeah, and you know, it's it's a concern, um, and it's certainly something that I think is being discussed. Uh, I believe New Hampshire Municipal Association was discussing that as recently as last week. It is, I mean, I'd like to make the point that it, it's a, it's a management issue as much as it's a policy issue, right? So if police officers are, are doing their job impartially and with full training, um, you know, it's not their job to worry about the budget. It's their job to keep us safe. It's the council's job and, you know, potentially the chief of police to worry about the budget and, and how all the finances work. And so, um, you know, again, I view it as our job to enable municipalities to have the choice um, of how they use those funds. But I think there's a common misconception today that police officers, when they stop you, <laughs> you know, that that money is collected by the town. And, and I think it's important for people to understand that that's not the case, first of all. And second of all, that, you know, a police department that's well administered, you know, their officers really shouldn't be worrying about the financial part of things, but rather just doing their job. Thank you. Further questions? Um, Senator, I have a question. You, sure. you refer to speeding tickets, and I'm yes. not familiar enough. Is this only speeding offenses or does this cover all traffic violations? Yeah, that's a great question. My understanding is that it is speeding tickets. I'm just looking... All right, safe. It, it is, I, you know, parking revenue and parking tickets are definitely handled differently. So my understanding is that it's all speeding tickets. But again, let me just. Right, but but my question is specifically yep. to speeding as the actual offense or is it any violation for reckless driving or other other types of things? Yeah. yeah. Cell phoning. Sure. Yeah. Sure. That's actually an excellent question. Um, let me get back to you on that, Senator. Okay. Further questions? Senator Rosemont. Thank you. Um, it was my understanding, I don't know if this is correct, that the, these fees currently go into the highway fund, but that they're used to support police standards and training. Is that? It's not anymore. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Senator D. <laughs> Ms. Jim, if I could address that. Please, yeah, where does uh, it go? It, it, at one time, there was a penalty assessment attached to a ticket. The penalty assessment fee did fund police standard to training. That's how we began police standard to training. Okay. That bill was passed in 1973 huh. when was head of police standards to training. What happened in two sessions ago, we changed that. 
Okay. We, we, we now fund police standards and training out of the general fund. So the, the, the dollars that went to police standards and training from, from the penalty assessment, that they don't exist anymore. They go, they go in different directions at this point in time. So police standards and training is fully funded okay. through the general fund. Hope okay. that clarifies that situation. So with a follow-up, uh, yeah. Senator, when you say go in different directions, yeah. is it going to the general fund? Or, is it, or are there other allocations of the fine revenues? Maybe, maybe yeah. uh, Steve uh, Lavoie might be able to answer that. I don't know. Penalty assessment, Steve. Penalty assessment. Come on up. Come on. <laughs> the, uh, the 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 penalty assessment. I'd like to get you out, I can let you know the exact amounts, but I know a portion goes to the Judicial um, Technology Fund. Um, I believe a portion is involved with... Um, the library. I'm sorry? The Judicial Library. So uh, the, I'm not sure about the library. I believe there was so a domestic the violence can, component. People can go and research their own. Yeah, um, and then there's a third. There's three distinct right. pieces, but they're not necessarily traffic specific. Related. Okay. All right. Um, Further questions for the senator? Senator Daniels. Thank you. Can uh, uh, security on college campuses like UNH, uh, can they stop and fine? No, I believe those are separately administered, um, Senator. I don't believe those are municipal, but again, I can get clarity for okay. you. And follow up? Yep. Uh, what, what about uh, county sheriffs? Can, can they stop someone? And if so, where does that money go? Yeah, that's another good question. I don't believe they have traffic authority, um, but I don't want to speak yeah. out of turn. So I will look into these questions for you. Thank you. Senator Hennessy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And while you're making a list, fish and game officers. E yes, yep, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> I, I have my research projects. <laughs> sure Any thing. further questions? Sure thing. I do think sheriffs are authorized to, to write uh, traffic violations. You do. Again, we can confirm that. That would be great. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you, and we look forward to your homework assignment. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> thank you very much, everyone. Okay. Uh, next on the list, um, opposed but not speaking, Alvin C., representing himself, and then uh, opposed but speaking, Gary Abbott. Associated General Contractors. Gary, welcome. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, for the record, uh, Gary Abbott, the Executive Vice President of the Associated General Contractors of New Hampshire. And, and I'm glad the uh, sponsor of the bill tried, tried to clarify some things. I'm here basically on, if you look at the fiscal note, if you're going to move a million dollars out of the highway fund, um, the highway fund, uh, we don't really have a lot of new revenue coming into the highway fund. If anything, the highway fund is being depleted in the sense of electric vehicles and all the other things that come along. So the number one concern for the Associated General Contractors is the, the moving of the money. The second issue regarding um, the policy. I think the policy over the years by the legislature, making sure that it's not an incentive for uh, local police to uh, uh, give out tickets and therefore their town benefits is part of the issue. I also believe, and I, I don't really want to add to the sponsor's research, um, I don't think the highway fund gets all of the different types of fines. So if you're going to do a policy you may want to really look at what should be the total policy. Um, should the state get a portion of local fines? I mean, I'm just, this is what, if you change the policy, you probably ought to look at all the policies because I don't believe the highway fund gets all different types of fines. But I know Senator D'Alessandro probably knows better than I do. But over the years, things have changed. So this just kind of opens the door for one thing but it may raise a bigger issue. You may have bills in the future come saying, okay, state roads lead to local roads, so every fine is connected to the state, and the state should get a portion of those. I'm just playing it out. I don't understand completely 
exactly what fines would this would fall under. So clarification there would be big. So that's why today here uh, we oppose uh, Senate Bill 441 just on the basis of shifting the money and not maybe having a consistent policy. I know the legislature has de dealt with fines and how much the courts get, how much. And the highway fund, I will, I will make a pitch that the highway fund uh, helps all the communities and its projects and the legislature does the 10 year plan. So it does go back to the towns, but in a different form. So with that, I would end my testimony and answer any questions. Questions from the committee? Thank you. Hearing none, thanks, Gary. Next up, uh, Marie Mullen from DOT, speaking opposed. Good morning, Marie. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, Marie Mullen, I'm the Finance Director at New Hampshire DOT, and um, I'm here to um, oppose this bill, um, mainly due to the concern with the highway fund balance and revenues. Uh, there continues to be erosion um, of revenue due to the increased fuel efficiency of all vehicles. Uh, the department received a federal grant several years ago and Cambridge Systematics did a study um, looking at the fuel efficiency and how that's impacted the revenues coming into the highway fund through the road toll. And um, they had determined that based on the fuel efficiency and what they were con continue to see going forward, they anticipated about a 1% erosion of revenue due to this fuel efficiency over the next 10 plus years. Um, uh, and also, go ahead. 1% yes. total over 10 years? No, 1% per year per on year. average, Thank yeah. You. So some years be a little less and then some years grow a little more, Thank but 1% percent on average. Um, to understand the highway fund a little bit better too, currently in law, 12% of all of the road toll and motor vehicle fees are directly sent back to municipalities. So that is in law right now, it's a block grant payment and that goes directly back to municipalities. Um, in the last budget session, uh, the legislature recognized the gap in the highway fund and they were very generous. They transferred $58 million from the general fund to help shore up the highway fund. So, you know, we're concerned, even though this seems like a small amount of money, a million dollars, we continue to need to be subsidized by the general fund um, because of this erosion in revenue. So those are some of our concerns and why we oppose this bill. And I welcome any questions from the committee. Any questions from members of the committee? Senator Rosenwald, please. Thank you. I just couldn't hear the amount that that 12% represents. It's $34 million. A year. Yes. Thank you. In FY21, it was $34 uh -huh. million. Dollars. Yep. Sorry, I did not mention the amount, so. <laughs> Thank you. For the questions, just for the information of the committee, uh, Representative Major and I are uh, co-sponsoring legislation to look at, a, I think it's called a road user fee, because we continue to see the decrease in revenues. We got to deal with the problem, and it is a growing problem, so just be aware of that, and I know the commissioner is as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and uh, speaking, our final listed speaker is uh, Steve Lavoie from the Department of Safety. Good to see you again. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. For the record, Steve Lavoie, Director of Administration for the Department of Safety. Um, before I begin my testimony uh, related to the penalty assessment question earlier, 66.66% um, goes to the general fund, 16.67% goes to the victim's assistance fund, and 16.67% goes to, to judicial branch IT fund. Um, so that's where those funds are, are going. Um, so I'm here on behalf of the department um, opposing this bill for a lot of the same reasons that um, the Department of Transportation is. Essentially, any reduction in revenues to the highway fund um, is of concern to us. Um, and the fact that, uh, as mentioned previously, the locals are receiving 12% of the collections um, already through the block grant program. Um, the highway fund does have a structural deficit. What I mean by that is that the expenditures to maintain existing levels of service are growing at a higher rate than the revenue collections. Um, the road toll, as you mentioned, um, is, is a concern as, the, as fuel efficiency um, increases. Um, we have seen 
since COVID-19 came a significant drop in road toll collections. And the road toll, again, is the gas tax um, that we're speaking to. Um, we, we are projecting now road tolls to recover to only 95% of pre-COVID amounts. Prior to COVID, we were seeing an increase of about 1% each year, but that 1% is not sufficient due to the increased cost of doing business with the state. Um, uh, the other issue with the structural deficit that we've seen is, is during the budget process um, in House Bill 2, there was $50 million that was um, transferred from the general fund to the highway fund um, to help uh, address that deficit throughout this biennium. Um, that's really a short-term fix. Uh, a long-term fix is needed. And until we have a long-term fix and a healthy fund, um, we wouldn't be able to support um, any reductions in revenue. And I'm happy to address any questions. Steve, just for the benefit of the committee, could you explain who collects the road toll and how it's administered? I think safety collects it, correct? Yes, yep. Um, the Department of Safety, the Road Toll Bureau, collects um, the road toll. Um, that is um, that is a, deposited into the highway fund after the costs of the collection are removed. So the funds to, to run the Road Toll Bureau and their collection, there is an audit function that they perform to ensure that the distributors are uh, voluntarily in compliance with the reporting. Um, and we do bring in approximately, um, there, there's a restricted and unrestricted portion of the road toll. The restricted portion is used by DOT to fund Betterment um, bridge projects, and then the unrestricted will fund the highway fund as a whole. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Steve? Hearing none, thank you very much. Thank you. No further people signed up to speak. Um, we have uh, from the remote testify on the Senate, Cindy Kudlik, an elected official representing herself, supports. Uh, Curtis Howland, a member of the public representing himself, opposes. William Domenico, a member of the public representing himself, opposes. And Daglin McEachern, am I pronouncing that right? McEachern. McEachern. McEachern, the mayor of uh, Portsmouth, supports. Anyone present who has not spoken or has spoken wishes to speak a second time? Hearing none, we'll close the hearing on Senate Bill 441. All right, well, we will now begin the hearing on Senate Bill 343, establishing a committee to study the formula for distribution of room occupancy tax revenues and recognize the prime sponsor, Senator Hennessy from District 1. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Thank you. Aaron Hennessy, Senator for State uh, for Senate District 1, which is the northern quarter of the state. I am here to introduce SB 343, establishing a committee to study the formula for distribution of room occupancy tax revenues. Um, this came at a request of one of my small towns up in the North Country in Coas County. Uh, the town of Gorham sees a lot of um, people coming to visit their small town. 
and they have hotel rooms, they have restaurants, and so uh, their economy definitely does enjoy the benefits of the visitors um, to Gorham and to the area of the, um, the beautiful northern part of the state. However, they don't see much of a benefit from the tax that they collect. Um, they are grateful for Senate Bill 99 that we passed that increases the tax revenue that's sent back to the towns. But according to the town manager, for which you received a letter of support of this bill, um, Denise Valley, the tax revenue that's sent back to the towns is less than the revenue that one restaurant in Gorham um, collects. So if you think about that, um, this bill really tries to help the small towns and even the big ones. We heard last, um, or the big cities too, um, we heard last week Senate Bill 338 from Senator um, Prentice was attempting to um, collect a fee on rooms on rooms of $2. Um, I've told Senator Prentice that I'm happy to incorporate her bill into the study part of my bill to look at the different ways of collecting these fees, um, if, if it makes sense to collect such a fee. Um, the history of this bill is that it has been studied before, um, and what it came out is that the DRA was not able to actually collect rooms tax um, information on a location-based they do have a new revenue information management system that is able to do this. However, we have not set it up this way yet. So for example, if you own a motel in Gorham, if you own a motel in Portsmouth and you own one in Claremont, you may report your revenues based on where your, loca your business is, um, your um, management is located, which could be in uh, Manchester. And so right now they don't have a means of, they don't have, the requirement of reporting revenue by lo uh, location of where the revenue is collected. Um, so that's why I wanted to put this into study, try and figure out how difficult it would be to collect this information based on location um, and um, many more details. And again, I've told Senator Prentice that I'm open to a friendly amendment to add her bill into mine, not the collection of it, but studying the collection of the fee. I'm open to any questions that you might have. Questions from members of the committee. Senator Daniels. How long ago was the previous study done? <sighs> Sorry, I don't remember the answer to that. I think that it was probably about six years ago, but I'm not positive. Okay, I think DR, I'm going to ask DRA to testify shortly, so I'm sure they can probably answer that okay. question. Okay. Uh, Senator uh, D'Alessandro. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> this, this study only calls for the room, the occupancy. The, so, so, you've, so you've got the rooms and meals tax that, that uh, people pay on, a, pay on a monthly basis. So what you're asking is a segregation by revenue administration of all the money collected by meals versus all of the money collected by rooms versus all of the money collected from rental cars. So you're going to make that separation on, on, on this multi multi-billion dollar uh, <laughs> receipt uh, and, and, and this committee is going to study that and then make a recommendation as to how the, the, the rooms portion of it is then appropriated to all, all of the communities. Do, do you think that's a Herculean task? Well, I think that's what the point of the study committee is. You make a great point, but I think as a state that we should be able to tell where we're collecting rooms tax, where we're collecting meals tax, and where we're collecting rental car tax, and how much of each of that tax we're collecting. If we're just bulk collecting the information, that doesn't tell us anything um, to, to state senators or representatives or those making decisions based on this tax revenue and what we should be doing. I would also offer that <laughs> restaurants don't provide revenues for rooms and Rental cars don't provide revenues for, rest for restaurants. So I think the DRA will probably testify to this. They may already be segregated, but let's let DRA answer those questions. Right. Yeah. Can uh, I just, just to follow up to answer that question too. One of the, the big reasons why people want the collection, the more additional revenue back based on the rooms collection is because the rooms, um, when people spend more time in a town or a city, the increased expense to um, 
to the first responders goes up, fire alarms go off, people have to respond to that. So there's, there's a much more increase in expense related to um, the rooms tax collected versus the meals tax. Okay. Further questions, Senator Rosenwald. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, this, as I understand it, Gorham's point is we're a tourist destination, um, so we have cost. We don't get what we think is fair back because we're little. I guess my question is, given that the, the bigger cities like Manchester and Nashua have a lot of hotels that do a lot of business work, do you have any concern that smaller towns might actually lose money if we did change the formula to address where the, where the tax was collected? I think that is a great point, and I think that's why I chose to make this a study committee, <laughs> because um, for places like Gorham, I do believe that they would see a, a huge increase in, in the, the benefits of doing something like this, but since we don't actually have the information, let's, right. let's look at what the you actual results like would be they... before we implement something like this. Thank you. Okay. I, I mean, I can see commentary purpose, I can see establishing a flat fee to go to all communities and then a certain amount above that. I mean, there's ways to address that issue right. to make sure that everybody has a reason a for a study. Up? I think it'd be a good thing to study. Could I ask one more question? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, four House members seems like a lot um, for one senator. Is, were you thinking that there would be four different committees or... That is a good question. I, I just have always seen four House members on study committees that I'm on. You have, yeah. Oh, so it's. Would you consider maybe three? I would. I would. Cons I would be open to friendly amendments. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Further questions? Hearing none. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, signed up in favor, but not testifying. Uh, Representative Edith Tucker from Coos Five. Um, and remote testifying, we have uh, Cindy Kudlick, an elected official test representing herself uh, in opposition. So any, anyone present that wishes to speak that either has spoken once or hasn't spoken at all? Hearing none, close the hearing on Senate Bill 343 and open the hearing on Senate Bill 435. Senator Dalshan, would you please take the chair while I introduce my bill? We'll open the hearing on Senate Bill 435 and call upon the prime sponsor, Senator Guida. an act relative to the net operating loss carryover under the business profits tax. Morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, for the record, Bob Guida, Senate District 2, and prime sponsor of Senate Bill 435 FN relative to the net operating loss carryover under the business profits tax. Uh, currently, um, our business profits tax un under apportionment double apportions. In other words, the business gets hit twice. We're the only state in the union that does this uh, under the apportionment methodology that we have uh, in an effort to make us competitive with other states or less unattractive. Uh, this bill proposes to remove that double apportionment hit and, and, and limit it to a single apportionment as all the other 49 states do at the present time. I have brought in an amendment. Uh, it's an amendment 0016S to 435. Uh, the reason being your bill in its original form went far beyond what was intended. And I think it was just the good intentions of the drafter uh, uh, and the OLS uh, what, what the original bill did was to remove um, 
the uh, cap <coughs> and the time frame restrictions on claiming uh, the net operating loss carryover. Uh, there are folks, I think, from DRA that will be better able to talk about those specifics. And it was suggested that this amendment be brought forward because the size of the impact on our, on our tax base, I'm sorry, on our tax revenues was going to be much more significant if we enacted the bill in its original form. Um, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions and I'll defer the technical questions over to our folks from DRA. Senator, are you, are you offering an amendment 0016? Yes. Okay. So every, everyone should have that on, right. their, on their desk. Amendment 0016S is being offered to Senate, to Senate Bill 435FA. Right. So te let's take a look at that. And Senator, who will, who, will, uh, who will discuss the amendment with us? Will, will DRA do that? Or, I'm sure or, that they are prepared to do that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So, as there were other testimonies yeah. uh, okay, as well. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Any questions from members of the committee? This was, again, this amendment was drafted with the discuss discussions with BIA, with right. DRA, and so okay. I think they're all represented here today. Okay. So, so the amendment actually replaces all of the bill? Correct. At this point in time. So, so the new bill that we will be discussing uh, will be taking a testimony on is 0016S, the amendment. And there are copies in the back of the right. room for anyone yeah. here that wants Thank them as well. Uh, any, any further questions from members of the committee? If not, thank you very much for your testimony. And, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Now, is, uh, is someone here from, from DRA? Okay. Why don't, you have, why don't we have you come up and address the, 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 the amendment, and then we'll call upon the public for their commentary. So call upon DRA, please. Good morning, Senators. Carolyn Lear, Assistant Commissioner at the Department of Revenue. With me is Devin Roderick, Senior Financial Analyst. Speak um, into the microphone, sure. please, so that we can hear you. With me is Devin Roderick, Senior Financial Analyst with the Department of Revenue. I'm going to work from the document that we sent around, our Fiscal Note Quick Guide, which is a document that is familiar to you. And I'll explain how this Quick Guide correlates to the amendment before you. So the real substance, in my understanding from Senator Guida, the real intent of um, the bill and is reflected in the amendment is to eliminate New Hampshire's sort of oddity and uniqueness in double apportioning net operating losses. Currently, a generated NOL gets apportioned in the year that you incur the loss, and then again in the year that you utilize the loss to offset income, and that is very unique to New Hampshire. It's unclear to me whether that was even an intentional component of the business profits tax statute or sort of a drafting oddity. Um, the first page, or the first and really second and on to the third page of our fiscal note quick guide discusses and analyzes um, that change proposed by the amendment and you will see um, on page three at the top um, that m fixing if you will that oddity um, does result in a loss of revenue over the course of the three fiscal years noted here. Um, the additional component of the bill as amended would synchronize our calculation of the NOL to the Internal Revenue Code of 2018. If you look at the amendment now, on lines 11 through 16, you will see specifically on line 12 that the taxpayer is directed to use the Internal Revenue Code as it existed on December 31st, 1996 to calculate their net operating loss. Um, for all other purposes, 
under the business profits tax statute, the taxpayer uses the code of 2018 right. to calculate their liability. That incorporates all of the changes um, effectuated by the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that was um, put into place in 2018. Surveying practitioners, um, we don't think that, I mean, you'll see that there's a, a small fiscal impact of effectuating that change. Um, many practitioners reported to us that they don't even own a copy of the 1996 code. Were they to try to comply with that, they couldn't. Um, and as a result, they're sort of already doing this um, using the 2018 code to calculate their NOL. Um, that being said, in looking at taxpayers' returns, we have to sort of assume that they are following the law as it exists. Um, and if you make that assumption, um, incorporating the code of 2018 would result in a very sm small, um, in comparison to total tax revenue, increase in revenue. Um, that's primarily due to the fact that the Internal Revenue Code of 2018 limits the use of an NOL to 80% of the taxpayer's taxable income. On the last page of our fiscal note quick guide, um, the final section, repealing the 10-year limitation and $10 million per year cap on net operating loss deduction carry forwards, presuming you intend to um, act favorably on the amended version, you can ignore that section because this is the section that the amendment eliminates. Um, current, under current law, um, NOLs are limited to the generation of $10 million in NOL and can only be carried forward for 10 years. Um, removing those limitations would effectuate a meaningful impact on revenue that is very difficult to predict. Um, but presuming you act on the amendment, you can just forget about that issue. Okay. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions that the okay. committee has. Uh, Senator, Senator Russell. Thank you. I totally did not understand that. <laughs> so, are you saying that if we adopt the amendment, the cumulative cost over three years will be the uh, loss of $18 million or the, or the gain of $4.5 million? So it would be the net of those two. So a loss of t roughly $12 million um, because the $18 million is offset by a gain of 4.5. If you pass the amendment. If you pass the amendment. Thank you. Further question? Okay. Um, did I see someone else with a question? No. Uh, okay. Conformity is, is sort of the key issue. And we, 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 I thought we passed along but that brought us into conformity to, to the, uh, the IRS tax code of, uh, of 2018, right? We did. And um, when we did that, we did not change the um, specific reference relative to NOLs. Right. And looking into the history of that, you know, the federal government has done a lot of um, significant things as it relates to the calculation of NOLs over the course of the last two decades since 1996. So in some respects, that may have been purposeful, but I think maybe only for a few years, and then we just sort of forgot, forgot about it. Okay. But this has been a, a, an issue that has been debated over an extended period of time. Am I correct? Absolutely. I think we first started um, more systematically updating our code reference in probably 2015-ish. Prior to that, I think the whole business profits tax statute outdated code in the early 2000s. Um, is there anyone? Uh, you're an accountant, Senator Hennessy, yeah, but, but I thought you might talk about uh, conformity. <laughs> okay, uh, thank, uh, stick around because I'm, I'm sure that's something that might come up afterwards. But thank you very much for your testimony. And uh, do you want to turn the chair back to uh, Senator Guider? Thank you.
Signed up next to speak, uh, we have Greg Moore from uh, Americans for Prosperity in New Hampshire speaking in favor. Greg, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, it appears that a lot of other people are probably going to be offering similar testimony, so I'll be very quick. Uh, this is a, a, this change is important as far as overall state competitiveness. Uh, obviously, that's something that we've spent a lot of time focusing on is how can we make the state competitive, particularly for multi-state businesses or states choosing where to put more of their uh, investments. And this is a positive step. We think it's we think it's a it, it's it's something that's long overdue, and we appreciate. Uh, finally bringing some attention to it. I've had some opportunity to talk to some business accountants who through the years have mentioned this specific issue as, as a problem, uh, historic, a historic problem, uh, particularly coming out of, coming out of uh, the cycle, bad cycle, like we saw in 2009, 2010. And that, I, we thought we were going to see in 2020, but didn't quite see as badly. But there are still a number of businesses that, are, that did have bad 2020s, and I think this is going to be a positive step to them. So with that, I'll let all the other people say that very similar things. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Are there any questions? Hearing none, great. Thank you very much. Next up is um, uh, not speaking, but favoring Bruce Berkey from Next Era Energy. He's provided written comments. And then we have Dave Juve and Steve Waller from the Business and Industry Association speaking and in favor. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Dave Jubay. I'm a senior vice president for public policy with the Business and Industry Association. We serve as New Hampshire statewide chamber of commerce. And for another 10 days, I'm serving as interim president, a position I will be happy to relinquish once our new president, Mike Skelton, starts. If I may, I notice your hair has turned white. <laughs> I, I, I thought I thought being at the top would be an easy gig, but it hasn't turned out that way. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of this bill. I um, would also like to introduce with me Steve Lawler. He's a CPA and principal at Nathan Wexler here in town. He also serves as the chair of BIA's Fiscal Policy Committee and is a tax expert where I am not. I just want to talk a little bit about how this legislation came about. I've been at the BIA for 22 years now working on fiscal policy and was completely unaware of this double NOL apportionment issue until one of our members called me last summer questioning it. And I, honestly, I didn't even really know what they were talking about because it made so little sense. But in investigating, I found out what they were saying is true. New Hampshire, unlike any other state, double apportions the NOL, the net operating loss. So what that means is if you're a multi-state business and you have a nexus here in New Hampshire, you're apportioning your business profits tax with New Hampshire and all other states you are doing business in. If you have a bad year and you suffer a loss, you also apportion that net operating loss deduction. So that's that's the first apportionment. And by the way, that's how virtually every state does it. What's different in New Hampshire is in subsequent tax years, when you go to use that net operating loss deduction, it is apportioned again. And in discussion with the uh, DRA, we couldn't understand why that was taking place. We went back to the original statute, and, and I will say that I think the statute is vague, and I think the interpretation was, was not one that BIA would have agreed with. So that's what led to us to approach uh, the chair to ask if he would um, sponsor legislation to correct what we think is a miss interpretation of, of statute and certainly is different than any other state handles net operating losses. The, uh, we provided um, um, legislative services with some draft language and got a draft back. My tax group that I work closely with reviewed it and everything looked fine from our perspective. Um, and then one day I got a call from Senator Guida uh, asking me to call him back. I did so in his first words were, Bob Guide is not happy. <laughs> and as a lobbyist, that's something you never want to hear. 
And so I asked uh, why, and he explained that the, the draft that we had all signed off on had um, provisions in it that we had never requested. And I think the, I, I think the OLS um, did not intentionally do this, but what happened is in, in taking out the section dealing with that double apportionment, they removed other things in the section, which included the $10 million cap and in, in number of years you could carry forward. That was something we never asked for. We recognized that that would have a dramatically negative impact on state revenues. And um, frankly, we just wanted to focus on this very narrow issue. So the, the fix for that, because the legislation had already been signed off on, was to do um, an amendment which, which struck all the original language. And that's the amendment we would like you to consider, which, which just focuses on removing that second net operating loss uh, issue. And it also, the, we didn't request this, but we have no objection to it. In fact, I think it's a good idea. It also brings New Hampshire into conformity with the 2018 um, IRS um, uh, regulations, which I think makes things simpler for businesses here in New Hampshire. In general, I think it's good if, if we can conform with IRS regulations and everyone understands that, that they're the same thing. So Mr. Chair, that uh, concludes my testimony. Um, I have Steve Lawler here if there are specific technical corrections about how net operating losses work, but uh, we're both happy to answer any questions. Question from Senator Rosenwald. Thank you. Um, if I think about businesses that are more national in scope, but have a presence here, and businesses that are only based here, is there any differential impact of making this change on one group or the other? Would you mind if I ask Steve Lawler to address that? Because, <laughs> no. because both businesses will be taking net operating losses. One is apportioned, right. the, the multi-state business is and apportioned, the other, the other is not. Yeah. So I'm not sure if they're treated the same, but Steve, would you mind? Yeah, I mean, again, um, if it's a New Hampshire business, they would, uh, if they don't apportion their NOL, then they would get 100% of their NOL in the subsequent year. If they were a multi-state business, and we're not even talking about, you know, we could have a business that does business in Vermont and New Hampshire, and maybe 50-50, you know, they end up with this double apportionment getting hurt because they're paying more New Hampshire tax than they would have if they didn't have this double apportionment. Follow up? Thank you. So doing this though wouldn't hurt the business that only does business in New Hampshire. No, it would it wouldn't hurt the New Hampshire business. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of times with tax legislation, uh, we often talk about winners and losers. This bill or this proposal, there are no losers. It multi state businesses that are currently being double apportioned, it would have no negative impact on any state business. Okay. Senator D'Alessandro. Uh, first, first of all, thank you very much for your, for your uh, commentary. Um, I knew Nathan Wetzler. Nate was a good friend of mine many, many, many years ago, and a wonderful accountant, by the way, wonderful accountant. Uh, just comment on, uh, we passed this bill, and we, put ourselves, in, I like the conformity issue, obviously. I've been talking about conformity for 20 years here in the fall on deaf ears, but now we're, we're gonna conform for a change. And had we conformed under the, under the tax law that was passed at the federal level, we would have received twice as much money in repatriation that we did receive. So we, we lost a, a ton of money at that time. Just comment on, on the, the, the uh, DRA type, talked about the loss that would, be, would occur when we made this transition. Do you agree with that or, or disagree with that statement? She said we'd, we'd lose the difference between the 12 and the four. So let's talk about an eight to $10 million loss in revenue. That'd be a one-time situation, I'm sure. Yeah, if I could start on that and then turn it over to Steve. Sure. It's important to remember with this, we're talking about a, a relatively small universe of companies. The, the first whittling down is we're only talking about multi-state companies that apportion their taxes in New Hampshire. 
The second whittling down is we're only talking about companies that that sustain a loss that results in, a, in an NOL. So, um, I mean, on one sense, I guess we could say 12 million sounds like a lot of money, but in the grand scheme of things, uh, it's not a huge amount of money. However, you know, if we're taking away that second apportionment, there will be a revenue impact. I guess my response would be, uh, given what the impact is and given the fact that it seems unfair on the face of it, that is something that uh, should be addressed. But Steve, if you want to. Mm -hmm. yeah, of course, there's going to be a revenue impact, Senator. And um, But I also think it's not fair to New Hampshire businesses that they have to, uh, you know, if you have a, a, a small business in New Hampshire, and, and, and I don't want people to fixate on multinational business. We're talking about just a small business that does work in two states, you know. And that's the, in that business. If they have a if they have a tough year, and they recur a loss, they get hurt in the subsequent year when they incur income that a business that's just in New Hampshire, you know, doesn't doesn't have that. And so, it, it becomes unfair, um, I think, for our businesses. And I think we want to have our businesses be able to uh, compete and be able to cross state lines if they have to, and to grow and and provide employment and things here in the state. Thank you. Sure. Further questions? I have a question of DRA. Uh, as I read the fiscal note, uh, I note that it says cumulative, cumulative fiscal impact of the proposed legislation. Is that 18 million minus the four and a half on the back page over the 22, three, and four, or is that each year? It's each year. So we would lose $14 million each year. If you, yeah, no, that I'm sorry, I should, yeah. yeah. So if you're looking at page three of the document, in 2022, we'd lose four, in 2023, 15, in 2024. Uh, 2023, 15, and 2024, 18, and then 18 in each year thereafter. Um, so the maximum yearly impact is 18. It's smaller in the first two years because of the proportion of revenue received in a fiscal year attributable to old tax years where this change wouldn't be reflected. Okay, thank you. Senator Hennessy. Thank you. I thought I heard you say that the um, the amendment changed these numbers. The amendment does not change these numbers. The amendment, if you go to the final page, the bottom section of our fiscal note um, analysis discusses removing the $10 million cap and eliminating the 10 year carry forward of NOLs. That is a facet of the bill as proposed that is not reflected in the amendment. That change would have a substantial fiscal impact but has been eliminated from the amended version of the bill. So all that remains is the $18 million loss attributable to eliminating double apportionment and the $4.5 million revenue gain attributable to conforming to the 2018 Internal Revenue Code. Safe to say that the net would be about 13.7 million for the outlying years? Yes. Okay. Yep. Senator Hennessy. Thank you. Sorry for making you repeat some of this. Just to clarify, for Senator D's purposes, I never did taxes, <laughs> except for my own. So, um, <laughs> why would we see? So we've heard about why we're going to have a loss, but mm -hmm. why would we see a revenue gain? So the revenue gain attributable to Internal Revenue Code conformity is because under the Internal Revenue Code. A taxpayer can only utilize an NOL up to 80% of their taxable income. 
So there are some number of taxpayers that for New Hampshire purposes currently utilize in excess of 80% um, to essentially completely offset their income and have zero tax liability, they would no longer be permitted to do that were we to conform. Okay, so follow-up. So 1996 rules, which we are following right now, say you can use 100%. 2018 rules, which are in conformity, which would be in conformity, say 80%. Correct. And that's where this comes from. Exactly. Thank you. Other questions? Senator Rosewall. Thank you. Do you know what the impact of the amendment of well, this $13 million a year tax loss, what the impact would be on the education trust fund? Yeah, we'd have to do the analysis because there is a proportional impact. Yeah. Thank you. That would be helpful. We calculated it as a total. Further questions? Do you know offhand the size of the business profits tax in total collected annually, let's say for the last year? You can. It, Sorry, I'll, I'll get it to you in just a second. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Can we get back to you with that total number? Sure, sure. I have the I have the total business. I just need to split a B, BT and bet. Okay, I can't hear yeah. your question. I have the total business, but I'll just have to get back to you with the split of BPT and bet. Um. Just one, one moment. One second, I'm sorry. Sure, it's okay. <clears throat> if you can, if you can get back to us, yeah. it's not. Sorry so about that. Yeah, we have it instantaneously here. Yeah. So. Yep. I know. Any further questions? Hearing none. Thank you, and I truly mean thank you for the for the excellent job you do for the people of our state and and our government and our businesses. It, I understand the rims the rim system is working out very well. I talked to the commissioner. It is. Um, I would say that it's been pretty transformational, and you know, Lindsay, our commissioner, and I have been doing a good amount of strategic planning as it relates to the future and just thinking about how we can continue to leverage that tool to provide you with better information and quicker information and more information. Thank you. Senator Hennessy. I just have some information for the committee on questions that were asked. I was looking into this for another bill that I'm working on. So the business enterprise tax, um, when we make changes to that, it changes the education trust fund more than the business profit tax because the business profit tax is allocated 6.2% to the general fund and 1.5% to the education trust fund, whereas the business enterprise tax is allocated um, the 0.1% to general and 0.5% to education trust fund. So Mr. Chair, just also in um, 2022, there were 381 million in uh, business profit and 120 in business enterprise. Can you say that number? I think no, that's not right. Yes, yeah, million. 381 in business profit tax and 120 in enterprise. If I'm reading this correctly from the LBA. Is that right? Thank you for that. No? Chair, sorry. That, those numbers sound low for an entire year. So in December, that's the year 
Yeah. What? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking at the year to date. It did sound low. <laughs> Ignore those figures. <laughs> For the questions. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for your testimony. We'll go into executive session for about uh, 15 minutes. And we'll be back. Executive session recess. Recess. So we'll recess for 15 minutes for executive session. There we go. Thank you. I know what I meant. <laughs>
It's moved by Senator D'Alessandro, second by Senator Daniels. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? We're now in executive session. Uh, would accept a motion on Senate Bill 343. Senator Hennessy. Thank you, Senator Guida. I move ought to pass, and I'd like to speak to my motion. Second. Seconded by Gary Daniels. Senator Daniels, uh, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senate Bill 343, um, I appreciate the um, opportunity for this legislative body to look at how we apportion out our uh, rooms tax, and I just want everyone to know that I will be bringing a floor amendment to incorporate studying uh, Senate Bill 338 and some questions, outstanding questions that we had on that bill. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Carries. Uh, we'll take a look at Senate Bill 435 relative to the net operating loss carryover. Will, will Senator Hennessy be taking that out? I didn't hear that. Will Senator Hennessy be taking that out? Yes. Thank you. Move off to pass on Senate Bill 435. Okay. Daniels moves off to pass on Senate Bill 435. So he can move out to pass as amended. Should move out to pass the amendment. Well, we move out to pass as amended. Then we deal with the amendment. It is your intention to move the amendment. Yes. Right. But you can't get to the amendment without getting to the bill first. Right. So Senator Daniels moves out to pass as amended. And now we would accept the introduction of the amendment. Okay, Senator Alessandro moves. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Hennessy. Now, discussion on the amendment. Mike, 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 there you go. The, the amendment actually re replaces the entire bill. Right. And uh, according to the testimony we have heard and, and the, the uh, fiscal note that was presented by by Revenue Administration, there is a loss. That loss is incurred over a period of, of time. But by coming, by, by A, conformity, I think, is a very key issue. So that's, that's a part of the bill that I find acceptable. And I think the fact, of the, the fact that a 1996 law was in place, totally, uh, totally inappropriate, really, in terms of the, of the situation then, Glad somebody discovered it. So I like the conformity. It's about time we did that. We are going to suffer a loss. I think people have to recognize that. But when you look at the, the, the basics and you look at the amount of money that the business profits tax brings in, I, I think it's, it, it's de minimis over the, over the big scheme. But recognize the fact that that loss is going to continue for a, an extended period of, of time. Uh, and at the same time we're taking that loss, we're reducing the tax rate uh, a, a number of times too. So, I mean, taking those things in, into consideration. But I do think it's the right, it's the right thing to do. Uh, it, does, it, has, uh, it puts us, it puts us in the same playing, uh, on the same playing field as, as all of the other states. It corrects a, a situation that, that, Existed, has existed here for a long period of time, but I think you have to understand what the what the uh, what the consequences are, and we have. To, I think uh, you have to exercise judgment as to if they're acceptable. So, so that's, I mean, that would be my rationale for supporting it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Any further comments, or questions, or discussion? Hearing none. On amendment. 2022-0016-S. Um, motion is by D'Alessandro, seconded by Daniels, to pass the amendment. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Amendment carries, and now we will go to ought to pass as amended. Move the item. Second. Moved by D'Alessandro, seconded by Daniels. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? 
and that carries. And um, I will take that out. Right. All right. Any further business to come before? Do you want to do any of uh, these? The other two bills? No. Uh, well, 313, is, I've got a, a very significant amendment coming okay. uh, with a lot of stakeholders, and we're meeting on that, so that's still okay. live. I, I meant for, uh, 437 or 441. Oh, the ones for today. today. Uh, no, we, we, we need to do some more discussing on those. There's some, some questions about some language and possible amendments to those. So at this point, we'll, we'll, not, we'll not address those. Mr. Chairman, I, I think there were a lot of questions in which the sponsor was going to get answers right. back to us right. on those as well. All right. Okay. Any further business? Senator Hennessy. Make motion to get out of executive session. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? We're out of session. Any further business come before the committee? Hearing none, we are adjourned.